Hello, everyone. Welcome you back to study this uh, robotic course. Now we move on to study lecture one of module four. Before we enter the study of uh, lecture one of module four, let's have a quick overview about the learning objective, the blueprint of a robot and the low map of learning. So this slide basically remind you la, about the, the, the role for you to adjust your mindset. So you, you are recommended to put yourself into the mindset of a designer, then you will enjoy the study of this course because uh, the keyword designer will help you to consolidate all the topics learned in this course together. Then as a designer of a robot as a product, you must know the answer to these four questions. Question number one, who are the user? Question number two, what are the needs of the user? Question number three, what are your robot which could meet the need of your user or buyer? Question number four, what are the solution behind the design of your robot? By now, you should know the answer to the first two questions. So we have uh, generalized the user in manufacturing and uh, in other places. And the generalized need from uh, this user is to have a motion provider or motion executor. And that you know, robot is a good candidate for us to use in order to perform automated motion in terms of uh, change of the position, change of the velocity, change of uh, acceleration, etc. So therefore your focus of a study should be on the design of the blueprint of your robot and also to know what should be the solution behind the design of your robot. This slide basically gives you a general guideline about the blueprint of your, your robot. And in this slide, you will be able to identify the topics that you have studied so far. For example, we know how to design the software for robot so that the robot will be able to undertake uh, task planning, action planning, motion planning, task planning, category planning. Also, we have a uh, study, the, the general principle uh, for the design of a robot body in which uh, you could identify the design of a mechanism the use of a microcontroller, the use of an actuator, the use of a sensor, etc. Also, you have uh, already studied module three, which is about the, uh, the modeling of a robot in terms of uh, kinematics, dynamics, statics. This knowledge actually will enable you to design simulator of a robot in today's term, uh, the simulator uh, of a robot is also called as a digital stream, digital stream uh, of your, your robot or simulated version of your actual robot, right? So the knowledge about the kinematics, dynamics, and the statics will enable you uh, to develop uh, or to design, okay, the simulation of uh, the digital twin of your robot, all right? Now we move on to study module four. Module four is very important because uh, module four will enable your robot to perform uh, controllable motion. How to achieve uh, controllable motion? 
then you can find the answer from the study of uh, module four, <clears throat> all right? So this is a roadmap of uh, learning and uh, you see the keyword design, okay? You remember I asked you to put yourself uh, into the mindset of a designer. Then from the viewpoint of a designer, you understand module one will enable you to design the software for your robot. Module two will enable you to design the body for your robot. And the module three will enable you to design digital string or simulator or simulation of your robot. And the module four will enable you to design control system for your robot. So you just keep this keyword, uh, design and the designer in mind, then you will feel happy uh, about the study of uh, this course. All right, so now we move on to study lecture one of a module four. Lecture one of a module four will give you the basic knowledge about the system, about the control system, in particular about the basic design method in control theory. And uh, we, we cannot afford uh, to spend time to cover advanced uh, control method because uh, control theory or control engineering on itself uh, is a big cause. Uh, you may spend another semester, or one or two semester to study control theory, control engineering, advanced control methods uh, such as uh, impedance control, adaptive control, robust control, intelligent control, etc. However, with the foundation about the basic uh, control method, you should be able uh, to venture into the study of uh, advanced control method, all right? So let's begin with the basics about the system. So when you are going to design control system for your robot, the concept of a system is extremely important because uh, the purpose of a designing control system is to uh, change the dynamic response or static response of your robot in order to meet the requirement of your application or meet the requirement of uh, your user's application. So therefore, the concept of a system is extremely important, all right? Then question number one, you may ask yourself, uh, okay, what should be a system? So this slide gives you the definition. So a system consists of a set of elements or module which act and interact together for the purpose of achieving the common goal. For example, you see this uh, short video, you have a biped working robot. This robot has a left logo locomotion system, arm system, finger system, body system, head system, perception system, power system, etc. So you see, so this robot has many, many modules. They work together in order to achieve this, uh, this biped working on the ground, all right? And uh, then you may ask this question. It's like in the study of the physics, you may heard of this term, ideal gas, et cetera, okay? And uh, we always try to find out the, uh, what should be the best reference uh, for, for anything uh, in the world, okay? What should be the standard, okay? For uh, what should be the reference? Uh, it's like uh, when you design a mechanic uh, uh, system, one recommendation is to make use of a standard part. Standard part means uh, is the idea, okay? Uh, component uh, for you to use. Then in this way, there's no need for you to do the customization, okay? Then you save your time, save your cost, okay? 
Then in terms of a system, we may ask this question, what is the best system in the world? But interestingly, the answer is what? The answer is a static system, okay? Then you may ask this question, what is a static system? So static system is a system in which the input output relationship is independent of a time, okay? So that means uh, there is no dynamic response or in technical terms, uh, there's no transient response. There's only a uh, steady state response. Typical example for static system are the sensor because we do not want the sensor to take time to produce output, okay? We do not want the sensor to have uh, uh, their own uh, dynamic response or transient response, all right? So this is the best system in the world. And uh, this is the target for designer of a control system to achieve. If you are powerful, try to make any dynam dynamic system to behave like a static system, if possible, all right? Okay, that should be your, your target, okay? Then, then this slide show you uh, a typical example of a static system. For example, if we are going to do a digital to analog conversion with this network of uh, resistor plus uh, operational amplifier, then you will understand this is a typical example of a static system because uh, there's no uh, transient response. So instantly, once you supply input, this is the digital number, okay, to this system, and instantly you will see the output being produced, okay, at this point. All right, and another example is about the sensor design. And the one requirement is to make a sensor to behave like a static system, okay? So most sensor could be treated as a static system, all right? And uh, okay, when there is a latency or delay in response, uh, uh, you should not treat that delay uh, as a transient response. Transient response means the, the value of the output vary, then stabilize at the steady state uh, value, okay? So when there's a little bit delay to produce, instantly get the uh, uh, light output, uh, you should not treat that one as a transient response, okay? So if we ignore the delay or latency in the response, uh, then communication system, uh, could also be treated as a static system. It's like when you send the information, send the email from one point to another point, and uh, the content of the email will never change. You know, then sudden uh, after a certain time, then <laughs> uh, become uh, the content of the uh, original version of the email. Okay, because the content never change. Okay, there's only a little bit delay. Okay, in in the reception. All right, so in this sense, there's no transient response in the output. That means your output never vary, okay? All right, so this, we can treat this also as an example of a static system, okay? Then what will be the property of a static system? So basically, a uh, static system only have a steady state response, okay? And uh, in terms of a steady state error, Okay, this error is always a fixed. And uh, in general, through the calibration process, we can always reduce this error to zero, okay? Because uh, there's no variation. So it's quite easier for us to compensate the error in any static system, all right? So this is a key property about the static system, okay? Then next question we, you may ask, okay? Uh, it's about the, what should be the ideal system in the world, okay? If let's say all the system in the world are not the best system because we have many, many dynamic system, okay? Then among uh, all the dynamic system, now this is because we, it's impossible, theoretically it is impossible to make a dynamic system to become a static system, therefore, within the category of a dynamic system, you may ask this question, 
among all these uh, dynamic system, what should be the ideal system? All right, understand? So then the answer will be linear time in the invariant system or LTI system. Why uh, do we ask this question? The reason is uh, uh, to simplify our study, our analysis, our design, etc. Because uh, once we have an idea system, then we can, uh, we should be able to formulate uh, the theory, the method, uh, etc. Okay. If we, you have a system which does not fall into this category, then it should be quite complicated uh, for you to uh, design a solution. Okay, to, to control it, okay, or to change the dynamic response. So then in this case, even when we encounter okay, non-ideal system or non-LTI system, we can always do some uh, approximation. That's at the working point. Okay, then we just approximate it, treat it as a uh, as an LTI system. Uh, all right, then in this way, we can apply all the principle or method. Uh, which has been developed based on the LTI system, okay, to, to solve uh, any known LTI systems problem, all right? Then you may ask this question, what are the property of uh, LTI system? Or what should be the criteria for us to use in order to judge, to make a judgment about the system, whether this system is an LTI system or not the LTI system, all right? So we must have a, a certain rule or criteria for us to do the judgment, okay? So property number one is about the time invariance, okay? If you have an LTI system today, if I supply this uh, input, then I will produce this output, okay? Then after one hour, two hour, if let's say I supply the same input, I should be able to get the same output, all right? So, the inner property of the system should be okay independent from time. Then from this point of view, you can start to think about the robot arm manipulator. Whether the arm manipulator will meet this requirement or not. Okay. So you may find out that on Earth, okay, the inner property of your robotic arm depends on the configuration, all the kinematic parameter, all the joint angle, because there's a gravitational force. If you change the inner input angle to your robot mechanism, then the gravitational effect will be different. Therefore, it is very hard for us to believe that the robotic arm on Earth will meet this requirement. But of course, if you send your robotic arm to work in uh, outer space, because in outer space, there's no uh, gravitational force, okay? Then it is, uh, then the arm will meet this uh, uh, requirement, all right? Uh, second property is about the homogeneity. So it means if let's say we scale up input by factor of A, then the output will be equally scaled up or scaled down by the same factor A, okay? In particular, if the input is a sine function, then the output will also be a sine function with the same frequency. Because here you see we have sine omega t, then at the output side, we will also see sine omega t, only amplitude and the phase of this signal will change. Frequency will remain the same. Okay, so this is the second property of the LTI system. So one is very important. Third property of the LTI system is about the superposition. So it means if we say X1 produce Y1, X2 produce Y2, then the final output is equal to Y1 plus Y2. So this means what? Well, we can treat this uh, MI, MO system. MI means a multiple input, MO means a multiple output as a sum of a single input, single output. SI means a single input, 
as well means a single output. So this is a very useful property, okay? For example, you have a robotic arm with a six degree of freedom. So it means what? You have a six input, John, six input angle, John angle. Then each input will produce the output at the two tips. So robotic arm is a typical example of a MIMO system. <clears throat> Then our question will be, how to make the robotic arm to behave like, a, okay, a sum of a six individual SISO system. So what will be the condition for our robotic arm to meet this property of a LTI system? All right, so this is a question you, you must keep in mind, all right? Okay. So once we know the idea system among the dynamic system, okay? Then we want to know what should be the definition of a general dynamic system, okay? So the answer will be any system in which the relationship between input and output is not independent of a time is called a dynamic system. So in other words, if you look at the output, the dynamic system will include transient response plus steady state response, okay? And uh, this slide basically show you the, the typical pattern of output from a dynamic system. So you will see the value from the output change, okay? So this change of the value, you should not treat as a delay, okay? Delay means uh, I delay it, then I output exact value. The value itself will never change. But here it means what is a change of the value as a function of a time, all right? So, and uh, eventually you may have an oscillation, okay? And the final value may not converge to the desired final output, okay? So this is a typical uh, pattern, okay? Or behavior, okay, from the output of any dynamic system, all right? Since, uh, the output of a dynamic system can change as a function of time, then we need to set some uh, indicator uh, for us to judge, okay, the quality of the output or performance of the output from a dynamic system. So in general, we have uh, three key uh, indicators uh, about the uh, performance of a dynamic system. Uh, indicator number one is about the stability, Indicator number two is about the response time and the indicator number three is about the response accuracy, okay? So stability could be uh, measured by the first or maximum overshoot, okay? You see this, if let's say we want the final output to reach value one, then you see the actual output, okay? It change, then oscillate, then slowly converge to the value one. So therefore, the maximum overshoot is an indicator about the stability. Then what will be the response time? Response time uh, could be measured by either settling time or rise time. Okay, how fast the, the output will respond to the input. Okay, so normally we use a settling time. Settling time means the time taken by the output to enter the error band center at the final output or steady state response, okay? The steady state response is one. So we want the output to reach the value one. Then we define the error band, okay? And the, let's say plus, plus minus 2%, plus minus 5%, plus minus 1%, okay, etc. Then what is time for the output to take, okay? For it to enter this error band, okay? All right, so that is about the accuracy. Then based on these three uh, key indicator about the system's uh, uh, response, uh, then we can okay, do a comparison between static system and the dynamic system. This is why from this comparison, then you know why we uh, give this answer, okay, or why we name a static system as the best system in the world, all right? Okay, so you look at the score obtained by static system uh, with respect to these three key indicators of uh, response accuracy. 
In terms of stability, static system is 100%. In terms of response time, normally uh, is zero, okay? In terms of uh, accuracy, 100%, all right? So we just, in normal situation, uh, well, we just uh, do this comparison. Then for dynamic system, we are able to achieve 100% stability. However, it is not possible for us to achieve zero response time, okay? And in terms of uh, response accuracy, it is possible to achieve a zero error result. So it means uh, it is possible to achieve 100% accuracy. Then obviously static system will stand out, okay? So this is why we, we ask you uh, to, to, to keep this answer in mind. Uh, static system are the best system in the world, okay? So this is very useful information for you to keep in mind. Then as a designer of a dynamic system, your goal is to make uh, your dynamic system to behave uh, like a static system as much as you can, all right? To make it to approach, okay? To the behavior of a static system, all right? Okay. Then how to achieve this goal? Let's say I, we give you a robotic arm. Let's say after the study of a module two, uh, some of you just start to design the, the body of a robot then uh, your mechanic team uh, give you this robot. Okay, so this is a mechanic system of your robot. Let you look at the response. It's unlikely for you to, okay, to, to obtain uh, the, the result which will, uh, will be satisfied for all kinds of application. Therefore, you face this question, challenge, okay? How to improve the dynamic response and also how to make a dy dynamic response controllable, okay? So then what should be the solution? The solution is what? To apply the magic result from control theory, okay? So this is why it's very important for you to know the basics of a control theory or control system, okay? Because uh, it's through the use of a control theory, you are able to improve uh, dynamic response from robot body, which has been designed by your mechanic team. All right, so then if you work as a control team in your company for the design of your, your robot, then you can further improve uh, dynamic response of uh, uh, robot as a result uh, from uh, mechanic design team, all right? So next, first question you may ask, your, uh, you may ask yourself, like, why should we uh, maybe use uh, uh, the result from control theory to further improve dynamic response from the robot designed by your mechanic design team? The answer is what? The answer is to, to further improve uh, dynamic response and uh, in order to meet the desired the transient response and the desired the steady state response, all right? So these are the two uh, major goal for you to make use of uh, uh, the result in control theory. Another goal may, uh, may be to make uh, the, the output from your robot to meet a specific dynamic, uh, 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 dynamic behavior. For example, for impedance control, we want your entire robotic arm to behave like a mass damper spring system. So therefore, the Laplace transform of output okay, will be equal to a specific description. That description correspond to the mass spring damper system. So that is the purpose of doing impedance control, okay? So you can make your entire robotic arm behave like a mass spring damper, okay? So uh, you may heard of this term, uh, we call it as a soft robotics, 
because mass green damper is a soft, rigid body, like, all right, it can adapt to the environment. So, so then you can also achieve that through the, the, the control, okay? But at the basic level, you just understand uh, these two goals good enough. Like, to have a uh, desire, the transient response, then in technique term, we call it as a servo control, okay? And steady state response. In technique term, in control theory, we call it as a process control. But uh, this term may this confusion for those of you who have a background knowledge in manufacturing, because in manufacturing, we talk about a lot of process, okay? Material removal process, deformation process, solidification process, welding process, etc. Then you see we share the same word, process, process. Then you, you, you create confusion, okay? So you can just think uh, process control as the control of a steady state response. Or you use another term, uh, we call it as the quality control. Quality control means what? We want to keep the actual value of any parameter uh, from a product, from a process, to be within allowable interval, centered at the design specification. So you have an upper limit, you have a lower limit. So the actual value should stay within these two limit. Okay. So that is the purpose of doing steady state uh, response control. Okay. So it means the same thing as a process control, quality control. Maybe you use quality control, then it's easier. So in general, there are two types of a control system, servo control system and uh, uh, quality control system, okay? Then for servo control system, for example, to have a desired transient response, then you may find uh, some specific name for the uh, control scheme, such as impedance control. Impedance control basically is to make the output, okay? response like a mass screen damper system, all right? So this help you to, to differentiate the, the meaning of a different term in control theory, uh, try to avoid confusion, all right? Okay, so for steady state response, uh, the key indicator, of course, like, should be stable. Like, if everything is not stable, no need to talk about uh, <laughs> anything, all right? First, criteria must mean like, absolutely the system must be stable, okay? Otherwise useless, all right? So uh, after pass through this uh, criteria or this judgment, then for steady state response, uh, the focus will be on the response accuracy, okay? So must remain there, okay? Then for transient response, response time is very important, okay? You, you, you should not, because the uh, server a servo control means what well, you must keep uh, follow the, the, the change rate of a desired response, okay? They should not create the delay, okay? So response time is very important, all right? So this help you to understand uh, the difference between different uh, requirements uh, in control theory and the different control scheme or method in control theory, all right? So then this example show you the typical behavior of a response from a system. If they say with the design, the uh, output is one, then you will see the actual output may take time, okay? Uh, to reach the desired output. Okay, so this is a typical pattern of a response, okay? Then in terms of stability, we do not want the output to converge to go to infinity. If we go to infinity, then this system is not stable. Uh, so we want the output eventually to converge to the desired output, but there is a boundary situation which separate, okay, stable system from a control system. This is this one that you see is oscillation, okay? You never go to infinity and then you also never go to a steady state response. It's like this one is like a sine cosine function because the magnitude never go to infinity, magnitude never reduce to zero, okay? So that, that is a boundary situation. So we call this response uh, as a case of a marginally stable system. So we use this uh, adjective, a marginally stable system, all right? 
So or you use this term uh, oscillation. Uh, oscillation separate a stable system from uh, unstable system. Okay. When magnitude go to infinity, then it become unstable. When magnitude go to zero or converge to zero, then it becomes stable. Okay. All right. And response time. So this example show you learn. Okay. So this is the time taken by the output to enter the error band, center it at the desired output. Okay. So this is the key indicator about response time. And sometimes we may also look at the rise time. Then for the rise time, we have a two definition. One is the, the time for the output to take, to move from 10% of a desired output to reach the desired 90% of the desired output. Another definition is the time taken by the output to reach, to reach the desired output for the first time. Because you see from zero, for the first time, he will reach here. But due to overshoot, then he will not stabilize there. Then uh, overshoot, then come back again. And overshoot, then come back again. Overshoot, come back again. Overshoot, then suddenly enter error band and never exit the error band. Okay, then, then the rise time become a settling time. All right, so, so we have uh, these two indicators uh, for us to know how fast is your system response to the change of the input. Then in terms of a response accuracy, so basically just to compare, like, okay, the actual steady state response with the desired steady state response. So you, if the difference is zero, then it's 100%. If it's not zero, then you calculate the percentage, right? And the good news is what well, with the time, uh, frequency domain design technique, then we have uh, this uh, final value theorem for us to estimate the steady state, uh, steady state value in time domain without uh, doing inverse Laplace transform. So this is uh, a final value theorem, okay, in control uh, theory, all right? Then next question, if they say my actual robot does not meet the desired response, then what should I do? The answer is what? To apply knowledge from control theory. First thing to do is to apply this uh, magic feedback control loop or negative feedback control loop. Okay, by default in control theory, when we talk about the feedback control loop, it should be always a negative feedback control loop because a positive feedback, neg uh, <laughs> positive feedback control loop will make your system be behave like an atomic bomb, like explosion, unstable, etc. All right. So by default, when we talk about the feedback control loop, it means what? Negative feedback control loop. All right. With this feedback control loop, the second the magic action that you can take as a designer is to add in additional transfer function to modify the dynamic response in order to meet the desired response, okay? So you, you just keep these two things in mind, okay? First magic thing to do in control theory is to introduce, to construct this uh, negative feedback control loop. Second magic thing to do in control theory is to add in additional uh, transfer function uh, in technique term. Okay, additional module. Then together, this module will make the overall uh, dynamic response to meet the desired requirement or desired response. All right. So these are the two powerful action that you can take. Okay, uh, with the knowledge in control theory. All right. Okay. Then. What is a closed loop feedback control system? So it's very simple, okay? So you just use a sensor to measure the actual output, then bring this measurement back to the input, then do the comparison, okay? Then the key philosophy is to know what should be the error between the desired input, a desired output and the actual output, okay? Then make your system to respond to error 
instead of a response to input. So that is a fundamental change of uh, philosophy. Okay, so this first action taken in control theory fundamentally changed the philosophy. Okay, uh, conventionally, everyone think about the, this relationship, the output will respond to input. Okay, so then in control theory, now you should change your mindset. So actually, a control system is a system which responds to error. Okay, once you have uh, this technical know-how in control theory, then you should tell people, okay, control system is a system which responds to error, all right? But this error could be anything. Then that is the magic, okay? Because um, I can design a system which responds to error. I don't care about the nature of the error. Error could be difference in position, difference in force, difference in torque, difference in velocity, difference in acceleration, difference in temperature, difference in pressure. Then you see the magic power, okay? As long as I make error to be zero, then you, you can obtain whatever you want. If there's a least error is equal to difference between desired temperature, actual temperature, then result is what? The so output of the temperature meet my design specification or meet my expectation. Done already, all right? So also this uh, structure is very simple. But the, the philosophy behind this uh, uh, feedback control loop is extremely powerful, all right? Because error could be anything, okay? So no restriction, because our focus is to make your error to be zero. Let's say I don't care about the, what is the physical meaning of the error, all right? Okay, then when we apply this uh, magic uh, feedback control loop to robotics, then obviously our desired output should be motion related uh, coordinate or variable. For example, position, velocity, force, torque, et cetera, all right? If we can make an error to be zero, so it means what? Our robot can deliver desired position, desired velocity, desired force, desired torque, okay? This is the need from your generalized user, okay? So you can treat this as a generalized need from your generalized user. So now you see with this magic power in control theory, actually you can achieve this, all right? Then you may ask this question, okay, what happens, okay, if I just introduce this uh, feedback control loop and uh, I still cannot uh, get the desired uh, uh, or to make uh, actual output to be very close or to equal to the desired output, then you have a second action, that is a, Second magic thing that you can do in control theory. The second action is what? To introduce a controller because this controller has its own dynamic response. Then together, for sure, you should be able to achieve, to make the actual output to be exactly equal to the desired output, All right? So combining these two magic action in control theory, you should be able to obtain the desired result, desired outcome, all right? Since the build up a feedback control loop is not a challenge as long as you have a sensor, so the challenge remains on the design of the sensor. So the question is, do you have a good sensor for you to measure position, velocity, force, and the torque? In particular, we want the sensor to behave like a static system. You should not aim in the sensor, uh, it has a lot of delay in response, or response has a transient response, then that is a, that is a big headache to you, la, all right? So this is the only challenge, okay? To construct the feedback control loop, the challenge uh, is on the design of a sensor. Then how to design a sensor which behave like a static system? Uh, this will be beyond uh, the, the study of this course, okay? So then for first action to take uh, is quite straightforward. As long as uh, we have an available sensor for us to close this loop, done already. 
The second question, how to introduce controller? What should be the transfer function of this controller? All right, so therefore here, we have a lot of the solution, okay? And uh, a lot of research work is going on, which has, has, has produced a lot of solution. And uh, obviously we cannot study all the solution in control theory. Then in this course, then we, we just show you the basic one, okay? Based on the use of this basic solution, you should be able to handle uh, uh, most of the uh, application requirement in manufacturing, in society, etc. All right. Okay. Then what should be the okay based on my discussion? Then this slide basically summarizes uh, what I've said to you. Uh, okay. First, the output strongly depends on input, and uh, actually the input are uh, called as a desired output. You see, I never put the input here. So this is, is to change your mind, okay? So make, make you to, to strongly think about this property, like this magic result, okay? If we can make this error to be zero, this is what, this is a desired output, okay? That's it. And the output of a closed loop feedback control system weakly depends on the dynamic constraint of an internal process. That is another magic sense, it's a consequence with uh, this uh, uh, feedback control loop, because we can always, this controller is very smart. If you try to make this one to be zero, make error to be zero, regardless the knowledge about the system under control, even the parameter here change, okay? So all the change will be reflected by the error here. Then controller only focus on this one. His mission, is to make an error to be, become zero, let's say. So here you can change parameter, it does not matter, all right? So this, this statement, so it weakly depends on this. Output of a closed loop feedback control system weakly depends on the static attribute of an internal process. So this means that even some uh, uh, kinematic parameter, dynamic parameter of your robotic arm change, it will not affect the output because uh, this controller we always make this to become uh, zero, okay? So in this sense, actually any controller will achieve uh, robustness of uh, operation by your robot. Because uh, in control theory, we have this term uh, robust control. This term is also uh, misleading to, to the beginner, okay? Of a designer like, in control system. Because uh, even you use a PID controller, linear compensator, it's also to improve the robustness of your control system. Okay, so they should use the other term, all right? So then, how to design control system, or how to design this controller? Okay, to because of the first action to close the loop, you just introduce a sensor, close the loop, done already. Then next big question is. Uh, what should be the controller for me to A in into my robot in order to make my robot achieve a very, very good performance, all right? So then we need to study, okay, the, the basic method and the advanced method. Then for this course, we, we, we just go through a basic uh, control method, all right? So at the higher level, you can choose to do the design in time domain. And uh, also you can choose to do the design in frequency domain. At the basic level, okay, it is good for you to follow the, the second methodology because in frequency domain, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, results uh, in mathematics, which help you to better understand the inner uh, structure, inner property, of your robot control system, all right? So these are the general guidelines at the high level. You can choose to do the design in pan domain or to do the design in frequency domain. So our recommendation at the basic level is to do the design in frequency domain, okay? All right? So now enter the study of a basic design method in control theory, okay? 
So here I will show you uh, a popular solution for the design in time domain, okay? So in time domain, there's a popular method which make use of a state space equation. State space equation means uh, we can define a uh, state vector x. x could be any internal uh, variable, uh, controllable variable, observable variable. Basically means uh, uh, you, you can use a sensor uh, to measure the actual value, okay? Of uh, x, uh, etc. That means they should be observable. If you have something you don't know what is the value, then you should not uh, put them uh, inside this vector. Then this is the first order derivatives of a uh, state vector. A is a matrix. B is a is a matrix of vector. U is a vector or scalar for input, and uh, y is the output. It could be a vector, could be a scalar, single value. C is a matrix, okay? So then you have a system of these two equation. The popular uh, control action or controller is a proportional controller. So it means uh, uh, U is uh, equal proportional to the error because Y here you can imagine is a zero minus Y, okay? We can always normalize the desired output, okay? To center it to be zero. For example, if this is not zero, it's 100, then everything minus 100, uh, then you have been bring it to zero, all right? To just normalize the, the, the output. And uh, we use uh, a steady state response uh, or quality control scenario as an example uh, to illustrate the, the design. So once you design it, then you can also apply it to perform a servo control, uh, okay? To follow something with, with this value, keep changing, uh, okay? So steady state response means what? Well, this one uh, remain unchanged, okay? But once you design your, your, your control system, you can also make this change. Then this one it will follow it, okay? So then you have uh, this scenario of uh, server control, all right? So then here you just treat it as an arrow. Here is what is, uh, is zero minus y. Zero minus y then become a negative y. This is why you see negative here, okay? So. So this is input here, this is the input, okay, all right, okay. Uh, no, this is the output here. Then input here is zero minus y. So zero minus y, then this uh, transfer function is a k, so it's a proportional controller, all right? So, so then in this case, so with this uh, design scheme, then you will see from here, I can replace u by this one. Then inside U, you have a CX, okay? Uh, because inside here, you have a Y. Then I replace Y by CX. So then this Y, then X dot become a AX minus B, K, C, Y. Then we, okay, combine these two together. Then you have a, a minus B, K, C times X. Then this is a operation with a matrix and a vector. Result is another matrix, so we name it as a, a prime. So again, now you see this equation, uh, x dot equal to a prime, okay? So this is a matrix equation. Conceptually, in time domain, solution to this one is equal to natural exponential function with the power, okay? Which is the function of a matrix a prime times t, okay? Then a prime, uh, is equal to this one, then you have this, okay? Then how to make uh, this one converge to zero, okay? Because if this, uh, uh, because when t go to infinity, if this one is positive, uh, then this will go to infinity, then explosion, uh, then system will not become stable. So therefore we apply stability criteria. For this one converge to zero. So important the conclusion is the eigenvalue of A prime must be negative. If the eigenvalue is a complex number or is a vector in the S plane, then the real part of the eigenvalue must be negative, okay? So let me just compute the eigenvalue of this one, then verify whether, then you choose the value K, because K is a design parameter, choose the value, value K so that the 
the real part of eigenvalue become a negative went down already. Then how to calculate eigenvalue? So you just calculate determinant of this matrix, then expand it. So this will give you a polynomial equation of order n in terms of uh, lambda. Then lambda will have uh, n root, okay? But interestingly, all this root, this one uh, is very much similar in frequency domain to the root of a denominator, okay? So it is a very interesting. So in time domain, the lambda eigenvalue more or less correspond to the uh, denominator of the transfer function in time uh, in frequency domain. All right. Then we want this real part of the the eigenvalue or real part of the root from the denominator uh, must be negative. So you see the same condition must be negative. All right, so this is a very simple design uh, scheme, okay? But this is not as powerful as the method like in frequency domain. Later on, we will show you four design method in frequency domain, which will tell you uh, more information, more knowledge, and give you more freedom to, 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 to do the design, okay? For your control system, all right? So understand, for those of you, if you do not know, what is the uh, eigenvalue, eigenvector? So I aim in this slide to help you to understand. So there's a basic uh, observation. Uh, any matrix, for any matrix, we can always find the vector, okay, V. The multiplication between this matrix and the vector equal to a scalar times this ve uh, vector. So basically it means what? Well, we project a vector in, project a matrix into a vector, okay? So then this we call it as the eigenvector. This is the eigenvalue, okay? Then how to find out the lambda which will satisfy this condition? Then we shift this to here. Then times this is the identity matrix, convert this one into a diagonal uh, uh, matrix. Then you have a two matrix, okay? Then you can do the uh, subtraction. Then we take out the V, then we have this. Then for this to be equal to zero, for this equality to, to be valid, so then the determinant of this matrix must equal to zero, okay? So then this determinant will give you a polynomial equation of a lambda. Then you have a N root, okay? Then all these root are called as a eigenvalue. Then we construct this uh, diagonal matrix. They say put the lambda as a diagonal term. Then also construct this uh, eigenvector matrix. La. So eigenvector V1, V2, Vn, put them. This is a matrix la, put it together. Then magic result is uh, this uh, matrix is equal to matrix V times uh, diagonal matrix D times uh, inverse of uh, matrix V, okay? So then come back to your state space uh, equation, like uh, x dot equal to a prime uh, x, okay? So here I just use a. Uh. So then substitute this one with this result, then you get this one. Then both sides times uh, from the left-hand side, uh, inverse of a v, then inverse of a v times this become i, uh, become one, disappear. Then you have the inverse of a, a v, then you treat inverse of V times X as a new state vector. Then you see the new state vector dot equal to D times a new state vector. Then what is this one? This is a diagonal matrix. Then this matrix equation become an individual equation, okay? Because a vector times diagonal matrix is equal to uh, lambda one times X one. Then you have an individual one. Then once you have a x1 dot equal to lambda one x dot, this is a scalar equation genre. Then solution is what? E raised to the power minus lambda one times D. Done already, right? So this is why we have uh, this conclusion, okay? So then the real part of the lambda one must be negative. So here you have a n lambda. So you have an equation. So actually, so this is a matrix formula. Then 
uh, individually, you have a n such uh, exponential function, all right? So this will help you to understand, okay, this slide, all right? So this is the background knowledge for you to, to know. Then you may ask this question, okay? So this is a universal solution. As long as if you have any system, which could be mechanic system, chemical system, uh, electrical system, information system, economic system, financial system, whatever, okay? If you have any system which could be described in this form, then this is a universal solution, done already. Then next question is to, to know, okay, is it possible for us to transform the dynamic behavior of any system into this representation? The answer is yes. So here I just show you two examples. We start with uh, uh, the simplest one. Uh, if let's say you have a robot, the, 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 the simplest robot in the world, this robot only has a single rich body, which is a view. Okay, so it, it, it has a motion that uh, it, uh, it can roll on the floor. Uh, okay, then the dynamic equation is just Newton's second rule. Uh, for example, this is a net force acting on this uh, single robot or single rich body robot. Okay then this will produce acceleration on the mass, right? Then x double dot equal to force divided by n. Then we just uh, consider x double dot is just equal to the, the, the output from the controller. The controller just uh, uh, issue the, the output, which will be equal to the desired acceleration, okay? Then we have uh, this one. Then we define this uh, state vector, state vector has a two element. Element one, x1 is equal to x, equal to position. x2 equal to x dot, okay? Therefore, then this equation can be written in this matrix form. So you can verify like, whether this is equal to this or not, okay? Because uh, x dot is equal to x1 dot, x2 dot, x1 dot is equal to x dot, x2 dot equal to x double dot. So then you see this, okay? Then you have a matrix A, matrix B, like this. You see, you, you obtain uh, an equation like this. So from here, then you define this is A, this is B. Then what is the output? So you can choose output to, uh, for you to observe. Like it could be position or velocity. Okay, if let's say I want to see output of velocity, then you put the zero one here. If I want to see monitor, okay, output, which is the position, then you use one zero, okay? So you can treat this as a selection matrix to select which one from the uh, state vector as the output, all right? So put together, you see, you have uh, this uh, uh, matrix equation, which describes uh, the dynamics of the uh, system under control, all right? Then you compare this to, to this one, uh, you see, it, 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 this, then you choose a U uh, when you design it like this, done already, all right, okay. So then, then, then second example, if let's say, because for this one, you can, okay, modify is X coordinate. Can we have a mobile base uh, which independently changes X coordinate and the Y coordinate? The answer is yes, it's this uh, uh, mobile platform with the only directional view. Okay, then for this special robot, the, the motion of X and Y are independent. Okay, so therefore you can treat this one to be the sum of uh, this one. Uh, let's say you have uh, one force to produce a motion in X that for X coordinate, another produce a motion for Y, uh, y coordinate. Uh, so you add them together. Okay, so therefore we have, uh, let's say for this one, so we observe, uh, they say X coordinate and the Y coordinate. So for X, so you see, you can just uh, treat it as, as this one, uh, okay? So it's the same situation. Then for Y coordinate, so you just um, imagine you have uh, another force which will produce uh, the, the change of uh, Y coordinate, okay? So it, it takes the same formula, okay? Now you add them together, so then observation here is uh, I can choose to observe uh, X coordinate, Y coordinate, or I can choose to observe uh, 
velocity x component of velocity y component of the velocity okay so a them together then you see this is a this is a b this is u this is a uh, x okay x dot so you says you see you have x dot times a x plus b u and the y okay is times c times what, uh, x you see you get this one once you have at least a uh, uh, state space equation then you apply uh, this solution uh, okay to design the key uh, to choose what should be the uh, proportional control gain okay inside this control group down already all right so it's quite simple to you all right now okay what will be the frequency domain method so in frequency domain so we will do Laplace transform la. then we have uh, this uh, transfer function which is the ratio between Laplace transform of input Laplace transform of output and uh, here I show you the result okay so this is Laplace transform of output Laplace transform of input input here means a desired output all right so this is the desired output this is the actual output and uh, this is equal to the ratio between two polynomia of uh, s s is a vector okay which has a horizontal component plus a vertical component vertical component is called as an imaginary number because you have a j j equal to square root negative one okay so but important thing here is the denominator okay we call this as a characteristic equation so this one is what the root to the denominator equation is very much similar to the eigenvalue, okay, in time domain of, the, of this matrix A prime, all right? Then the first method in frequency domain is this powerful method called as a Rouse Hervis criteria, okay? So this method make use of uh, the characteristic equation uh, or denominator equation, uh, okay? Then we use the uh, coefficient inside this polynomial equation to build up the, the first two row of a uh, Rouse array. And the Rouse array will have a uh, M plus one row, okay? So you have a S zero row, S one row, all the way to S power N row, okay? Then for the first two row, you use the coefficient to fill up, okay, the element in a zigzag way. For example, an is here, then you move down, an minus one, then you move up, an minus two, then you move down, an minus three, then you move up, an minus four, then you move down, an minus five, okay, in a zigzag way. Then for the element in the remaining row, you just uh, apply uh, a formula uh, to, to calculate this one. So this formula is equal to this one, that means you take a four value. The first two value always belong to the first column. Then the second two value always belong to the next column to this element. So this next column. So therefore you have a one, two, three, four, four uh, value, okay? So then you calculate this way, uh, this value in a diagonal way. This one times this one minus this one times this one divided by this one. Then you use this value to fill up this one. Then for this one is the same. Right? So you have uh, this one times this, minus this times this, divided by this, then you fill up uh, this, uh, this element, okay? So I will use example to illustrate the procedure. Then it's easier for you to understand, okay? It's the algorithm for you to follow, all right? Then we look at the value in the first column. The system will be stable if the number of a change of the sign is equal to zero. Otherwise, the system is not stable. Therefore, you use this uh, condition to, to choose the value of uh, the, the, the coefficient or parameter or design parameter inside the denominator. So you find the, what should be the value for you to, to choose uh, for the design parameter, which will appear inside the denominator equation, right? So this is the, uh, principle for this uh, design method, all right? So I use an uh, example to illustrate the procedure, then you can easily understand. That. For example, we give you this denominator equation or characteristic equation. Then we want to know what should be the value for k, okay? 
And uh, if let's say I choose uh, the maximum allowable value for k, then I will make the system uh, to become oscillation. Okay, move to the boundary of uh, stability. The boundary of stability means what oscillation. Once oscillate, then what should be the frequency of oscillation? Okay, so this is a example for you to uh, understand. Okay, all this knowledge. Okay, then. Okay, we construct a Rouse array. So in this case, Rouse array will have a four row, you know, because it's a three plus one. So you have a row S0, S1, S2, S3. Then you fill up the first two row in a zigzag way with the coefficient from the uh, denominator equation. So you have one, one plus K, 10, five plus 15 K. Okay, then zero, zero, like, don't need to fill up. Okay, then what will be this one? So this should be equal to one plus k times 10 minus one uh, times five times 15 k. The result will be divided by one plus k. Okay, then you get this one. Then what will be this one? So this one you go to this times this minus this one times zero divided by this, then you get this one. For this system to be stable, all the value in the first column must be positive because this is positive. So in order to make the change of the sign to be zero, then this must be positive, 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 All right? So then this positive, positive, positive. Then from this one, then you see K must be smaller than one. For this one, K must be greater than negative one. This one means what? K must be greater than uh, negative one over three. Then this condition is stronger than this one. Then you ignore this one, okay? Then combine these two together, then you have this one. The question tell you, k is positive, then you must choose a value for k, reason zero and uh, one, all right? Now, if let's say I choose a maximum value for k, maximum allowable value for k, I want to intentionally push the stable system to reach the boundary of a stability. So then you will see, and uh, when this equal to one, then this becomes zero. Then obviously you cannot calculate this one. Because uh, once this is zero, then how to determine this? This is zero times this minus two times zero, divide by zero. Then you, you do not know what is this value, la, okay? So when you reach this situation, so it means what? The polynomial equation from the previous row. Okay, let's say this is a zero row. The row la, with O zero, then in the previous row, you use these two coefficient to construct a polynomial, okay? Then this polynomial, we call it as an auxiliary polynomial. This auxiliary polynomial is a part of the original uh, polynomial. So that means uh, the denominator equation or characteristic equation is equal to auxiliary polynomial times remaining of polynomial, okay? Then this result is very interesting. It show you the root of this one also are the root of a characteristic equation. So therefore, by solving this one, because uh, this one is a polynomial equation of a lower degree, la, okay? Then you can find out the rule, okay? So this is the first uh, knowledge for you to know. And the second one, once you have an auxiliary polynomial, you compute first order derivatives of this auxiliary polynomial, then you get the another polynomial, and then, then you use the new polynomials coefficient to replace the zero, zero, then you continue, all right? So then we, we proceed, let's say from this uh, coefficient, because you this coefficient, this is correspond, let's say coefficient in front of uh, S square, coefficient in front of uh, S1, then coefficient in front of uh, S0. So you must consider this, uh, then uh, auxiliary uh, polynomial is uh, two times S square, this one is uh, 20 times x0 because s square, uh, s square, s1, s0, okay? So you get this one. Then you compute first order derivatives. Then you have this new polynomial, which is 4s plus zero equal to zero. Then four zero will be the new coefficient for you to replace the zero zero. Once you have a four zero, then you can determine this one. Now this is equal to four times this minus two times zero divided by four, you get this. Then you see this uh, criteria will tell you this system is stable, okay? It's still stable, all right? 
but it is imaginary stable, okay? And uh, it will hit the boundary of the stability, then there's an the oscillation. Then how do we know the, the, the frequency? So then from uh, auxiliary polynomial, we try to find out the root because this is the polynomial equation of a uh, degree two. And uh, you know, okay, solution is plus minus j square root 10. So this is omega. Omega is omega inside the sine omega t. So it means when you do inverse uh, Laplace transform, you have a sine omega t. Then omega is uh, the speed, uh, uh, angular speed of the signal. Then what is the frequency? Because omega equal to two pi f, then f equal to omega divided by two pi. Then this is the oscillation frequency, All right? So this is the first method. So you see, first method uh, tell you a lot of information. Uh, so it's much, much more powerful than time domain design method, all right, okay. Second method is to make use of a uh, uh, standard response of a second order dynamic system, okay. So then the transfer function for a second order dynamic, dynamic system is like this, okay. So denominator equation is equal to s squared plus two zeta omega n s plus omega n squared, okay. So you can introduce these two terms, okay. Then group these three together, then you have this expression. Then group these two together, you have this expression. Then graphically, this is equal to this one because omega d. This one is equal to this one, okay? Then these two components, A together, define this vector. This vector, actually, the length equal to omega n. And actually, this is a root of uh, one of the rule of uh, this denominator. Another, because this is a complex rule, then we have a conjugate rule here, symmetrically here, okay? So with a negative uh, g omega, so it's here, okay? So this equation, but the physical meaning of uh, this transfer function is to describe uh, by this drawing. So this is very important, uh, this drawing, okay? It help you to understand the meaning of a uh, zeta. So because this is zeta times omega n, this is omega n, then what is zeta? Zeta is actually equal to cosine theta, okay? So, so this is a design method two. Then by applying this method two, then you just need to know what should be the best value for zeta, okay? And based on the requirement of your application, then you can also de determine what should be the omega n, okay? So these are the typical response when you change zeta. For example, if you, I want to have an oscillation, then I will try to make uh, zeta equal to zero. If I want to have a best response, then I try to choose uh, zeta to be 0.7, that's it, all right? So another uh, result will be by using this uh, standard transfer function, then we can come out the formula for us to measure stability in terms of a maximum overshoot and the response time in terms of a settling time and also the time of a maximum overshoot or rise time or whatever, okay? So then these are the formula for us to calculate <coughs> the maximum overshoot. So this is an indicator about stability and uh, these two are indicator about the response time, all right? Okay. So I use one example to, 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 to show you like, how to apply this second method. For example, we have uh, this closed loop, uh, this transfer function uh, for the closed loop control system. Okay, now based on the requirement of your application or your robot, and uh, you want this zeta and uh, omega to take some specific value so that the maximum overshoot is just 5%. So this is a very, very small, okay? Very good stability. And the settling time should be less than two seconds. And the error band should be 2%, all right? So this is a design specification. Then if you know the formula for all these uh, design specification, then you just apply all this formula, okay? Maximum overshoot 5% means 0 0.05. Then you have this equality. From here, you see you only have a uh, zeta. So this is a very simple equation, and then you, you solve this equation, then you get this answer, like zeta equal to 0 0.69. Then for response time, two seconds, for error band of a plus minus 2%, then 
then you choose this formula. Because we know z dot, then immediately we know what should be omega n. So you see it done already, all right? Okay. And uh, one more example. Okay, so this is a typical example of a control loop for motor. And uh, you understand inside our robotic arm, we have a six model, okay? So if we know how to construct a control loop for each motor, then uh, you know how to design control system already. So you just follow this uh, scheme, uh, this diagram, okay? So this show you, we have an inner velocity loop. So here is a velocity at the shaft of the motor. Then go to integrator. Then this become position. So we have an outer position feedback. We have an inner velocity feedback. Okay, so this is a typical uh, control the design for the DC motor. All right. So if you are, you understand this one, basically you already understand the control or the at the lowest level. What should be the control loop for each individual motor inside your robot? Answer is what is this one? That's it. Finish, very simple, all right? So now this question asks you to determine capital K here, smaller K here, so that the zeta you go to 0 0.7, this is the best value for zeta. And the natural frequency is a four radian per second. Okay, what will be the solution, all right? So here, I just show you the, 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 the major step, okay, inside the solution. First, we need to replace the, the feedback control loop of the in, or of this inner loop like, by equivalent transfer function. So there's a formula like, in control theory. So that means the equivalent transfer function of the closed feed closed uh, loop control system is equal to the forward plunge transfer function divided by one minus uh, loop transfer function. So you pay attention is uh, negative. Negative here means what you have a negative one. So this one times this one times negative one. This is a loop transfer function. One minus negative become one plus. Okay, so you have a one plus. Simplify it, you get this one. So then you can replace uh, this by this. Okay, but anyway, we will we will come back to the principle for us to simplify the control block diagram. All right. Then again, we have an outer uh, loop for position control. Then we replace it by equivalent transfer function. So for what branch? So for what branch? One minus a loop transfer function. Loop transfer function equal to this one times this one times negative one. Then you have a one plus. Simplify it. Then you get this. Okay, expand this. You get this. Immediately you know this is what omega n square. This is what two zeta omega n. Okay, and the, the question tell you what should be the zeta? What should be omega n? Then you have an equation for you to determine capital K, small k. So from this transfer function, immediately you know omega n square equal to k, two zeta omega n equal to two plus k, small k, okay? Then you know what should be the k, because omega n equal to four, capital K equal to 16. Then from here, you know smaller k equal to two zeta omega n minus two divided by capital K, okay? So then you put in the value, you will get this result. Done already, so you see? So it's not very difficult for you to design a uh, control system in robotics, all right? Design method three, assume uh, if we see by uh, constructing negative feedback loop uh, and uh, by choosing uh, the initial parameter inside the control loop, okay? And uh, you still cannot get the desired response, uh, then what to do? The answer is what? Then you have a design method three. If let's say with the original uh, change of the parameter, you still you are still not satisfied uh, with the output, then you can add in okay, additional transfer function, then to modify overall dynamic response. The popular method is for you to add in PID controller. Okay, then in frequency domain, what is the PID controller? So basically you add in this transfer function, which consists of a three term. First term is proportional to error. You see, this is error. Second term is proportional to integration. Laplace transform of integration is equal to one over S. Third term is proportional to derivatives. 
Laplace transform of a derivative is equal to S, okay? So this is in frequency domain. So in time domain, it's just illustrate you about the physical meaning of the PID controller. So basically is to determine control signal based on error. And then we compute this one in three ways, okay? In practice, you may have a different version of a PID controller. For example, you can choose KI to be zero, then this disappear. Or you choose KD to be zero, then this disappear, et cetera, okay? So, uh, so you can customize your PID controller based on the requirement of, uh, of application. Then you see here, the dynamics on the control could be a robot, and the robot means what you have an end joint, okay? Then for each joint, you have a joint one, join N, et cetera. So for each join, you have a motto, then you can have a PID controller, all right? Okay, so here show you an uh, example, uh, okay? So then this is an example uh, about the MIMO system, okay? So you see this example has a, a desired output plus disturbances from the environment, okay? So therefore, in this application, we want to know what should be the error, okay? Steady state error, when we just use a proportional controller, okay? And uh, we want the steady state error to be 0 0.1, then what should be the value for k, all right? Now we want to reduce uh, the error, okay? To zero, zero error, okay? Then what should be the, but obviously with the k, you cannot, obtain this result, uh, then what should be your control action? And answer is uh, to A in PE controller, okay? So then we just uh, introduce uh, uh, PD controller here, then you will see you will achieve this result. And uh, similarly, because this is a disturbance, we do not want this input to produce any output, uh, okay? Because the output produced by this input is useless, it's error, genre, okay? Then how to reduce the steady state response due to this one to zero, okay? Since this is an MIMO system because the multiple output are merged together already and uh, we consider this is a linear LTI system. Therefore, in your mind, we treat it as a two SISO system, okay? So first SISO system is uh, between RS and the CS. Second SISO system is between DS and the CS, all right? So then we just uh, study uh, these uh, two individual SISO system, okay? So for the first SISO system, then we have a block diagram like this. So ignore DS, okay? Then the transfer function between output and the input is equal to forward prompt transfer function, one minus loop transfer function. Simplify it, you get the K divided by S squared plus two S plus K. Now we want to know what is the error here. And the error in frequency domain is equal to input minus output channel. Okay, then we want to know what is the transfer function between uh, error and the input. The error equal to input minus output, input divided by input equal to one, output divided by input equal to transfer function between output and the input. Then replace this one by this result, you get this one. Then merge these two together, then you get this result, okay? Then from here, then you know what should be the Laplace transform of error, okay? You shift this to the uh, right-hand side, then you know the Laplace transform of the error, all right? Once you know Laplace transform of error, then you apply final value theorem to estimate steady state response of error in time domain without the doing inverse Laplace transform channel, okay? So the input now is a unit run the function. So frequency domain, it is equal to one over S square, okay? Then E is equal to transfer function times the Laplace transform of the input. So one over S. So you have an S here, cancel out. Then here you can take out the extra S, then cancel out. The, then on top you have in numerator, like you have S plus two. When S equal to zero, numerator become two, denominator become a KS. So you have uh, this expression, okay? Now I want the error to be 0 0.5, then what should be K? So two divided by K equal to 0 0.1. Okay, I want the error to be equal to 0 0.1, okay? Then K should be equal to two divided by 0 0.1, 
my answer is twenty. Then I change my mind. I want the arrow to be zero. Then what should be the controller? Now you always remember P I E. Okay. And in particular, we need to have an I, I controller because the I integrator allow us to reduce the error to zero. All right. So then we use a PI controller. So PI controller is like uh, this one plus this one. So you remember uh, PI. So ignore D, la. D, treat this one to be zero. So P plus I. So it's a customized version of uh, PID controller. Okay. So merge these two together, you have this one, then you compute inverse of this one, then you get the S divided by this, okay? Then with S equal to zero, then you see this S divided by anything becomes zero. So you see magic result, okay? So you can choose any value for K1, K2, you will get this answer, okay? Zero error, okay? Then for second the transfer function, then how's about the making uh, steady state response due to ds to become zero. Okay, then we need to know like, what is the transfer function between ds and the cs. Okay, so for war prompts and the one minus loop transfer function, simplify it, you get this one. Okay, then you calculate what is the steady state response due to ds. So you apply final value theorem because from here you can compute Laplace transform of output. So Laplace transform of output is equal to transfer function times Laplace transform of uh, disturbances, okay? So now disturbances assume is equal to a unit step function, okay? Then in frequency domain, we have a one over S. So this one times one over S, then so S times this, then cancel the one S. When S equal to zero, then you have this one over KS, okay? How to make this one to be zero? Answer is what? Use a PI controller, okay? We choose this one to be PI. So then you merge them together, you have this compute inverse, then you become a S divided by this, like S divided by this. When S equal to zero, then you see you have a magic result, zero, okay? So with the PI controller, you will cancel out the, the influence of disturbances and also make this error to be zero. Therefore, the, out, the input is equal to the desired output, all right? Okay, so you understand. So then the last method is method four. So the method four is even more powerful because uh, this allows uh, allow you uh, to choose uh, desire the root of a denominator, okay? Anywhere in the S plane. S is a vector uh, for Laplace transform, okay? So you can pinpoint location here Let's say I want my, the, the, the rule of the denominator to be here or to be here, all right? So therefore from the transfer function of the closed loop control system, so we just focus on the denominator. So this is the standard uh, formula for denominator equation or characteristic equation of a method four. This method we call it as a loop locus method, okay? In case uh, if you have a denominator equation, which is not in this form, you can always transform it in, in this form. They don't have to show you the result. Then from here, you see, this is a, a transfer function, which is equal to the ratio between two polynomial equation of uh, S, okay? So we name it as a Z, S, and the P, S, okay? So then this is a, a denominator equation or characteristic e equation for loop locus design method, all right? So then the principle is uh, try to make uh, the location select by you. You say, I, it's like uh, in time domain, I want the eigenvalue to be equal to this value, let's say, or this vector. So you can choose a vector for the root or desire the root of a denominator, okay? Then, we, then you go ahead to design what should be the uh, parameter, okay, for, for the controller. So you can achieve, so this is uh, very, very powerful. That means you can blindly choose a uh, location uh, for the desired uh, root of a denominator. So you see, all right? And uh, this slide show you what happens if the denominator equation 
does not follow this uh, standard formula, then you can always transform Miller into the equivalent standard formula. For example, we give you this uh, transfer function of a closed loop control system. Then denominator equation is this one, uh, okay? So this does not follow the uh, this uh, standard formula, this expression, uh, okay? Then you should not worry. Uh. So you lump all this uh, coefficient, the term uh, which uh, does not belong to k together, okay? Then both sides divide by the sum of all this. Then you have a one plus k and uh, times this one. Then you name this one as a new uh, open loop transfer function uh, because here we call this one as an open loop transfer function, okay? So this one is equal to controller's transfer function times uh, uh, the system under controls uh, transfer function. So this is an open loop transfer function, okay? So then you have this equivalent open loop transfer function. And uh, then this uh, video show you uh, how to make use of a MATLAB to simplify your, 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 your work uh, for drawing the loop locus, okay? If let's say we give you this uh, open loop transfer function like this, then we want to know what are the possible loop of a denominator, okay? Loop locus basically just show you all the possible loop of a denominator for you to choose as a designer. If you are not happy with all these uh, possible root of a denominator. Then you can choose a new one. Then you A in, lead compensator, okay? To make a new root locus pass through the desired location of a root chosen by you, all right? Okay, so for this uh, open loop transfer function, once we close the root, then, then you will see this is a, uh, this uh, drawing show you all the possible location of the four root inside the denominator, okay? Then you make a decision as a designer, ah, okay, whether uh, you are happy with uh, this result or not, then you choose uh, the desired ruler for the final control system, then you choose. Uh, if they say uh, the solution in my mind are not on this ruler, you say, I, okay? Uh, none of my, my candidate or the root of a denominator are on these uh, four curves. You, you pay attention, we have a different color. So basically these are the four curves, okay? Each curve showing you uh, the possible location for one root because for this uh, system, we have a uh, four ruler, okay? If let's say you say uh, none of uh, this curve uh, have passed through, the location uh, preferred by me, then what to do? Then the answer will be, so you can modify, okay? You can modify the root locus, we have a new one, so that the new root locus will pass through the preferred location of the root locus. If you say, I prefer my, uh, the, the, the root of a denominator to be here, but it happens, uh, uh, this one is not on the original root locus, uh, then what to do, okay? So the answer is uh, for case one, in which your preferred location of a root are on the original root locus, then you do nothing, you just find out the value k, which will bring uh, the, the actual root to reach the desired location of your preferred root down already. In case, uh, if uh, the desired location of the root are not on the original root locus, then you A in this controller. This we call it as a lead lab compensator. So inside you have a one, two, three, three parameter. So by choosing the right value for these three parameter, you can okay, uh, obtain new root locus, which will pass through the desired location of your preferred root for denominator equation, all right? Okay, so here I use one example to illustrate 
this design method, then you understand how powerful is this method. Okay, assume we have a mobile base. Okay, so mobile base uh, has a has a two view Okay, then for one view, we just have this outer control loop Okay, just to control the the angular position. Then uh, without the controller, if let's have the controller equal to one, that means there's no controller. Then we want to know what, what is the response of this view, okay? Now we want to improve it. Now you see in my mind, okay, this is my preferred location of a root. Okay, I want the root of a, a denominator of the closed loop control system to be here. Okay, this is my preferred value. Then go ahead to design PD controller or delay compensator, then do a comparison. So first method, this is use method three to design this uh, control system. This is to use method four to design this control system. All right, okay. Then what will be the improvement of uh, relay compensator to the system? Okay, the so generic answer, you can say, improve the stability, improve the response time, improve accuracy. So the last question you can answer in this way, that's quite straightforward, all right? So uh, let's see what happens if there's no uh, controller, then how will, be, how will be the response from the view? Then when there's no controller, then you write down the transfer function. Then we have this forward prompt, transfer function one minus loop transfer function, you get this one. When k equal to one, g controller equal to one, then you have this one. From here, you see we have a two root which are on the imaginary axis is plus minus g. So then you use a MATLAB to, to see the time domain response. Then you see this is what oscillation, okay? So because the root reach the boundary, which separate right half plane to the left half plane. So this is the boundary of the stability. Then you see oscillation. So then it's confirmed, okay? You see it's a sine function. Then, Okay, obviously it's not acceptable uh, because uh, if you have a mobile robot with the view behave like this, it means what? Your robot is crazy, uh, okay? It just uh, move uh, backward, forward, uh, oscillate there, well, okay? So you have a crazy robot. Then how to make this crazy robot to become uh, useful? Then, okay, you can you try to choose a PID controller. Uh, so in this case, we use a PD controller, okay? So then, uh, you put in PD controller, then we update transfer function for what prompt one minus loop transfer function, and then uh, put in the all the term inside, simplify it, and then you get this one. Okay, and uh, here you see your we want for you like you say I want the 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 root of the denominator to be here. So basically, it means what the root is here, then you know omega n is equal to square root, omega n equal to square root one square plus one square, because this is the omega n. And uh, this is a 45 degree, okay? Because it's one, one, then this is a square, then it's 45 degree. Then zeta equal to cosine 45 degree. So basically then you know these two value. Then from here you see kp is equal to omega n, kd equal to two zeta omega n, all right? So when, uh, Kp go to two, Kp uh, then okay, then Kp go to two uh, Omega n because the Kd go to two zeta omega n. Omega n you go to this one, zeta you go to this one. Then you put in this value, then you will get the answer equal to two. All right. So then uh, down already. Then your PD controller is two plus two s. All right. So then you can verify the whether uh, the actual response is good enough or not, okay? So then you update your transfer function. Then in MATLAB, you key in the transfer function of a closed loop control system. Then you call this magic function, step bracket this uh, transfer function. Then you will see the time response. So you'll see no oscillation. Maximum overshoot is 20%, uh, it's quite a lot. Though. So it take about uh, four seconds to reach the steady state response, all right? Then we try to choose the design method four, okay? Uh, use a relay compensator. Since originally you have a k here, so no need for you to introduce another k, la, because the k times k equal to new k, la, okay? So it's equivalent, all right? So then we use this relay compensator. 
then to find out the, what is the uh, denominator equation. So it's one minus loop transfer function. Then substitute GC by this one, you get this one. Then extend it, you have a polynomial equation of, of uh, degree three, okay? And uh, since you prefer to have uh, uh, these two uh, loop, one is here, another is conjugate one is here. So that means uh, this one will contain three loop, two of them must satisfy your preferred ruler or preferred selection because you have already chosen two root. One is here, one is here. So that means what well, this one must contain the two root chosen by you. Then you have an extra one here, okay? So because this one contains three root, then you expand this equation. Then you have a polynomial equation of a degree three. Then this one must equal to the original denominator equation, okay? Then you have this equality. For this equality to hold, so it means what? P must equal to this one, K must equal to this one, and the KZ must equal to this one, all right? So then from uh, <coughs> this equality, K equal to two plus two, P zero, then you know what should be P zero, then P zero should be equal to K minus two divided by two, then you get this one. Once you know P0, then we can start to determine what should be a P. La. P equal to two plus P0. Then substitute P0 with this, then you get this result for P. Then what should be Z? KZ equal to this one, KZ equal to this one, P0 equal to this one, then two times this one equal to this. Both sides divided by K, then you know Z. Once you know P, you know Z, then you know B left compensator. Okay, substitute uh, value for Z value for P inside this uh, transfer function, you get this result, done already. Then you can use uh, MATLAB to do simulation. Here you see, you still have uh, uh, another freedom as a designer, because you have uh, extra freedom to choose a value for K. So you must enjoy this freedom. Then you try three values, uh, let's say K equal to two, 2.5, 3.0, then use MATLAB uh, to verify, okay? Then you update the transfer function of the closed loop control system for what prompts one minus loop. Then you have uh, this result. Then in my lab, you just key in uh, three uh, transfer function because for each k, you have a uh, one transfer function. And uh, when k you go to three, then transfer function yeah, looks like this. All right. So then this uh, uh, video show you the, the result uh, of 10 by using my lab, okay? So you key in three transfer function, which correspond to three value of K. Then you call this magic function. You put in uh, these three transfer function. Then you will see uh, these three output. Then obviously you see the best value for K is uh, 2.0. Because with 2.0, you see overshoot is what? Less than 5%. So it's better than PD controller, okay? Response time is about five seconds. Uh, it's comparable to four seconds. All right. So this is uh, show you the way how to make use of uh, design method three, design method two, uh, uh, five, uh, four to, to design a control system. All right. Then another useful tool is for you to know the final value theorem. Okay. And uh, in one of the example, we have uh, already used this result. Okay. So once you know the transfer function, uh, Laplace transformer, okay? Uh, for output Laplace transform for error, then you should be able to calculate steady state output without the doing inverse Laplace transform, okay? For example, steady state output, then you use the final value theorem, steady state error, final value theorem, okay? This is another knowledge for you to know. This is extremely important and uh, some students just ignore in this one. Okay. Okay, this is the only weakness with the uh, uh, feedback control loop. In a feedback control system, error from a sensor can never be compensated by feedback control. Okay, why? So I use this slide to illustrate. Assume your sensor for whatever reason, produce error, then transfer function become a original transfer function plus extra term, all right? Then 
since the controller will always make this guy to be zero because the controller don't care about the, uh, the physical meaning of uh, error. So his, his mission is to make uh, the error to be zero, okay? Then in this case, so when this one equal to zero, then it means what? Your actual output is equal to uh, this transfer function, okay? This is the desired output minus uh, the extra term due to error inside the sensor. So 100% appear in the output. So it means what? Any error from the sensor can never be compensated by feedback control. Keep this in mind, okay? So this is why you need to make sure that your sensor is 100% accurate. If your sensor has an error, there's no way for you to compensate the error or reduce the error from the sensor to zero, right? Okay, so that's all for lecture one of module four. So the key takeaway from uh, this lecture is for you to uh, know the property of a system, in particular, the property of a LTI system, and also for you to know the uh, design method in time domain and the four design method in frequency domain. With the uh, uh, application of uh, this knowledge, you should be able to handle the requirement of uh, controlling the actuator inside robotic arm or inside robot's mobile base. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you in the study of lecture two of module four.